Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 to 24, page 1069. For you have not come to what could be touched, to a blazing fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words. Those who heard it begged that not another word be spoken to them, for they could not bear what was commanded. And if even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. And the appearance was so terrifying that Moses said, I am terrified and trembling. Instead, you've come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to myriads of angels in festive gathering, to the assembly of the firstborn whose names have been written in heaven, to God who is the judge of all, to the spirits of righteous people made perfect, to Jesus, mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which says better things than the blood of Abel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There's a sermon outline there. Uh, Inside your newsletters on the second page, uh, there's uh, household questions up the top. God willing, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions at the end. Uh, If you have questions at home, please feel free to email them to me. Uh, If you have my mobile number, uh, text it through and Baxter will get it uh, on my phone in my bag and bring it up the front. But I want to begin with rugby. I want to begin with rugby. Uh, Really, this is not a rugby-specific analogy. You can apply this to any sport, okay, if you're caught up with the Barty party after. Didn't she play well last night? If you're caught up with the Barty party, uh, you can apply this to tennis as well. Uh, But I want you to – let's stick with rugby. I want you to imagine how you would answer the question, what's the purpose of a rugby game? What's the purpose of a rugby game? Uh, Now, you can answer that question in one of two ways. Uh, The first way would be to begin by looking at what's done in a rugby game. Uh, If you ask a prop, the purpose of a rugby game is to get as muddy as possible enjoying scrums. If you talk to a breakaway, the purpose of a rugby game is to be the most annoying tackler on the field and to give the halfback no peace. If you talk to a wing like I used to be, the purpose of a rugby game is to score as many tries as possible and to have no mud on your jersey by the end of the game. Invariably, when you start with that answer, what you do, the answer is limited and faulty. The purpose of a rugby game is scrums, tries, tackling, lineouts. There's another way you could answer the question, and you start a bit further back, perhaps in the commentary box or at the scoreboard, and you answer the question by saying the purpose of a rugby game is which group of 15 gets the most points. That looks at every aspect of the game and understands the bigger picture. Now, you could apply that to any sport, couldn't you? The purpose of tennis, the purpose of league, the purpose of soccer, the purpose of netball, the purpose of lacrosse. I suspect that a lot of people who are asked, what's the purpose of church?, actually answer the question, what do you do in church? If you begin that way, you'll get a good answer, but you won't get the whole answer, will you? And you won't get an answer that makes sense of the bigger picture. And so I hope that as you look back over the last five weeks, you'll notice that we didn't start with what you do in church. And we did that on purpose. That's our last question. What we started with was the bigger picture and then worked our way to what you do. Now, let me tell you, there are three benefits of this approach besides the fact that you get five sermons. The first is you avoid an answer that replaces purpose with action. You avoid reducing church to the stuff you do and you actually understand that it's about the relationships you enjoy and that's a pretty important fact to grasp, isn't it? The second advantage is that you actually grasp this very important truth. Jesus builds the church. You see, if you start by defining church with what you do, then who's at the centre of the picture? We are, aren't we? And church is all about us and what I can get out of church and what church will do for me. And that makes humans and their work central. But if you start with the bigger picture, 
The church is all about the meeting of God's people with him, gathered by him, and then work your way back. You'll actually understand that at the heart of church is Jesus and the grace that he shows us, the undeserved mercy and love of God that deals with our sin. And let me tell you, that's a pretty important fact to grasp, isn't it? And thirdly, when you deal with the questions this way, you realise that theology dictates what you do and not the other way around. You see, if you start your understanding of church with what you do in church, then everything about church is what works. Pragmatism. And that triumphs. But if you start the other way around and talk about what church's purpose is in God's big picture, then your theology shapes your practice. God defines what you are on about. And so we finally come to the question that many people start with, but we're going to keep as last. What do you do in church? And we can only get to this question because of all the other questions we've dealt with. Church is? Church is built by? Church is made up of? The purpose of church is? Uh, If you've missed any of those answers, go and hop on our website and look at the sermons and be reminded again. So the question we're looking at today is, what do you do in church? And those four previous questions shape what we're on about. Let me pray, and then we're going to look at it together. Father, thanks for your word. Thanks that we can read it. And Father, each time we read the same passage or another passage, you you reveal another aspect of your nature in your word your design, your plans, your purposes. Father, as we sit here today, we give you thanks so we can open your word and think about what we do in church. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let me remind you very quickly of those answers. Church is the physical gathering of God's people in one place at one time by God, with God, in the presence of God. The church is built by who? Jesus who's the mediator and maturer. Uh, The church is made up of Christians, people who've had their sins forgiven by the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ alone. And the purpose of church is fellowship, being gathered with God and with his people. Uh, But I want to actually go into each of our lounge rooms first. I want to actually think about what we are doing each day as God's people. And you'll see that that's point two on the outline. I want us to start with the everyday lives of the people of God. Those who do church are God's people, God's mob. The people of God have a very specific job to do. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10 tells us that our job as the people of God is to proclaim God's praises. (coughs) To proclaim God's praises. And as we do that, Two things will be evident in our lives. The first is in Romans chapter 12. Romans 12. Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship. Don't be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing and perfect will of God. To praise God is to give God what he deserves. That's worship. What does God deserve? God deserves the thing that has his image on it. What's that? That's us. That's our lives. That's every part of our existence. From digging a strainer post hole through to how you conduct your tax return from how you drive through to what you look at on the internet, through how you handle breakfast right through to how you do hospitality. Each and every part of the lives of God's people is to be giving him what he deserves. And there's a second part to that, and it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, 
do everything for God's glory. Every part of the life of God's people, each individual life, is to be a declaration, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, that says, look at God. How significant is he? That's giving God glory. So the lives of God's people, our everyday lives, what we do in our lounge room, at work, in the car, in leisure, as we swim laps, as we play sport, every part of our lives is to praise God, which means giving him what he deserves and telling everyone or pointing out how significant he is. The lives of God's people are about praising God, worshipping God and glorifying God. That's our everyday existence. And church is one of the activities we do as a group under that broad banner. It's what we're going to do forever in heaven. It's made possible because Jesus has dealt with our sin so we can meet God. It's the delight of being gathered together, like-minded people, meeting together, enjoying each other in fellowship with each other and with God. And the fellowship with God makes this fellowship with each other possible. And so what we do in church sits under the big heading of praise, worship and glory. When we do church, we're praising God, we're worshipping God, we're glorifying God. Our fellowship, just the mere existence of this group gathered together, says to the world, look how great God is. Look how wonderful God is. Now, how else could such a group meet together? When else does such a diverse group gather if God isn't that great? Well, that's a terrific answer, Bernard. But give me some (laughs) nitty-gritty. It's great that we can think such grand theological thoughts, but what are we to do in church? What does that look like? Well, surprisingly in the Bible, we're not given a checklist, are we? Have you noticed that? There's no passage in the Bible that says church looks like bang, 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 bang. I think that's wonderfully wise in God's sense. It means that church isn't constrained by a particular culture, is it? You can do church in Africa. You can do church in Venezuela. You can do church in the Arctic and the Antarctic. You can do church in Narrabri as well as Naramai. So what does it actually look like? Well, it actually means we've got to be very careful, don't we? (laughs) We've got to be very careful in what we say you must do in church. I think as we come to this, and I'm at point three on the outline, and you'll see a list there, and we'll work our way through that in a moment. We've got to remember this. The purpose of church is fellowship. Whatever we do must be about that about the gathering of God's people with God and each other. Uh, The first thing to recognise now is that we're broken, isn't it? (laughs) Many of us have had aches and pains this morning, if not in our limbs, at least in our hearts. Many of us are feeling damaged in our minds and in our bodies. So this fellowship of broken people will be broken, won't it? (laughs) It's not going to work perfectly. It's not going to be perfect this side of eternity. But it's actually the place where broken people can gather. Broken people can gather together with God and God's going to make them suited for his presence. I think the second, and that leads to this bit, the second guide as we come to these questions is that whatever happens in church, what we do builds that fellowship and works towards fitting us for dwelling with God. Uh, Come with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26. If someone gets it in the Pew Bibles, yell out a page number, please. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26. 1020. It's an easy number to remember. 1020. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26. How is it then, brothers? And whenever you come together, and that's the idea of church, each one of you has a psalm, a teaching, a revelation, another language, or an interpretation. All things 
must be done for edification. Whatever you do in church must be done for edification, for building up. Uh, Literally, that's the word for building a house. Whatever happens here when God's people gather, it must build the mob, the fellowship, not just in numbers but in maturity, in helping us to be people fit for dwelling in the presence of God, used to that, what it looks like. It's talked about in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19, just a couple of more pages back towards the back of your Bible, Ephesians 2, 19. So then you're no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints, members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. The whole building is being fitted together in him and is growing into a holy sanctuary in the Lord in whom you also are being built together for God's dwelling in the Spirit. Same language, isn't it? Who's the builder? It's Jesus, isn't it? What's he built on? The prophets and the apostles. Whatever happens in church, what you do in church is building that community. So what does it look like? Well, look at point three, and let's run through a rough, notice I said rough, rough checklist. Here's the foundational idea, the one that's right throughout all of them. Ephesians 4, verse 11. And he personally, that's God, gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, for the training of the saints in the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into a mature man with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. Do you notice those gifts there in verse 11? How many of them are there? Those jobs. There's five, isn't there? Do you notice the thing common to all of them? They're all about speaking. They're all word stuff, aren't they? God's word lies at the heart of God's people. God's word lies at the heart of the meeting of God's people. It makes it possible when you think about the word in the flesh And then it's at the heart of whenever that group carries on gathering. God's word, as we heard at the start of the service, is his last communication to us in these days. Hebrews chapter 1. God's word is the revelation of his very own nature. John chapter 1. God's word is the source of life. 1 Peter chapter 2. God's word exposes our sin and our need. Hebrews 4 verse 12. In God's word, we know God, we know life, and we know who we are. And it's what we need to live as God's people, 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17. So it's no mistake that when God talks about the jobs to build his mob, he starts with the word, Ephesians 4, verse 11. And the job of the people who handle God's word is to be builders so that everyone in the mob, is built up, is equipped, is trained, is enabled. And so whenever God's people meet, 1 Timothy chapter 3, God's word needs to be read and explained. God's leaders of his people need to be able to do that. Remember Titus chapter 2? So the whole meeting of God's people is created, established, structured on and around and matured by God's word and God's word alone. The second thing seems to be a strange one. You'll see it there on your outline. I've used a funny term. It's called sacraments. It's just picture language, picture language. The word sacraments is just the Latin word for road signs. They're signs pointing to something bigger. They're signs pointing to something bigger. Are there signs in God's word that always go with words? Words and signs need to always go together because you need the signs explained, don't you? And in God's word, there are two sacraments, two picture languages that explicitly are commanded. The first one is something we enjoy once a month. It'd be great to do it every week, wouldn't it? It's the Lord's Supper, isn't it? 
Jesus talked about that in Luke 22. And by the time we get to 1 Corinthians chapters 10 and 11, it's part of the meeting of God's people. Whenever they gather, it's created by Jesus, it's shown in Jesus, it's commanded by Jesus. And it builds the fellowship by reminding us of who we are. Every time we do it, we're pointed towards Jesus' body and blood. What creates us? The second sacrament is baptism. Jesus certainly commands it in Matthew 28. And by the time you get into Acts 2, when you have 3,000 converted there in Jerusalem, baptism is something the apostles do to show that God's people are together. It's a sign of what God's done in someone. Made them clean, made them acceptable. It builds fellowship by reminding God's people that they are united together and it's public. Something done in front of everyone. So there we go. We've got God's word. We've got sacraments. Third one is song. We like singing, don't we? Okay, We love singing. This is one of the few places where community groups gather to sing every week in our town, isn't it? And when you look at the Bible in Ephesians chapter 5 and Colossians 3, song, singing is part of God's people meeting together. And when you look at those two passages in Ephesians and Colossians, you'll see that songs aren't just sung because they make us feel good. They certainly do that, don't they? Songs are sung because they teach truth. It's no mistake that right throughout history, the way we get truth to settle in is by singing, isn't it? Do you notice that? If you want to learn something really well, you put it to a tune and you'll be able to remember it. There's no mistake that this has been the case for God's people right throughout time. Music works to teach, not just to inflame emotion, which it should, but to inform emotion, which it must. It's a statement of praise to God and it's a reminder to those around us of what we know to be true about God. That's how it builds up the fellowship. Well, we've got the word, sacraments, song. The fourth one is prayer. Uh, This was the one that struck me as really surprising. Do you know, I couldn't find a passage that said you must pray in church. Now, for a bloke like me, I suddenly got pretty desperate. I'm going to have to fudge the Bible here. But when I read a passage like Colossians 4, Paul is commanding God's people as a group, when they're together, to be praying. And so prayer is something we will do whenever we gather, won't it? What a great way to finish Sunday lunch if you've had guests over. Pray. What a great way to finish a cup of coffee together. Pray. What a great thing to do when all of us are gathered together. Pray. Prayer is a statement that we depend upon God. It's always been part of his people gathering. The Old Testament is full of it. And the persistent mention by Paul of prayer in his letters suggests that it is to be part of God's people gathered. It builds up the fellowship by reminding us of who we depend on. We depend on our Father in heaven, don't we? That's why we're here. And we've come to the last one. And perhaps this is a surprising one for many of you. Prophecy and tongues. Prophecy and tongues. I don't think anyone thought Bernard would talk about that from up the front, would he? But in 1 Corinthians 14 and other parts of 1 Corinthians, it's part of the gathering of the people of God, isn't it? Paul never says it shouldn't be. He just reminds them of how it should be. Prophecy, uh, it's not what we're talking about in the Old Testament. It's not necessarily what the 12 apostles did. By the time you get to the life of the early church, it seems to be this, a deeper God-given insight into his word. A deeper God-given insight into his word. Tongues. It's either a foreign language like we see in the book of Acts or it's a special spiritual language. But I hope as you listen to what Warwick read from 1 Corinthians 14, 26 to 32, they're only to be used when they can build up. 
the mob, the community together. And all of these are tied together in this way. They're tied together by love. Remember we've talked about that, the smell, the stench. Love is the thing that ties all of these together and drives them to build up the mob. It's what we're commanded in 1 Corinthians 13. It's what we're reminded of in Hebrews 10. Don't give up the habit of meeting together so that you can come together and encourage each other and spur each other on. That's what we do in church. The word, sacraments, song, prayer, prophecy and tongues, all bound up with love. Well, what would that look like in a regular week? Well, there's a fair bit of flexibility, but I think the four fences for the paddock to play in are love. That's the thing that drives it. It's to be intelligible. You've got to understand the words that are used. It's to be orderly and it's to be organised. Within that paddock, go with those things that we've heard that you do in church. I hope you notice that what we do every Sunday is like that. (laughs) And the best principle to structure what we do together is the good news of Jesus, isn't it? Isn't that how we do all of our services every week? When you look at everything on the slide and you step back and look at the big picture, not just the scrums, the tackling, the line outs or the wingers scoring tries, but you step back and look at the big picture, you will see the good news of Jesus structuring everything we do in church. Did you notice that today? We started off by reminding ourselves of what God's done. Hebrews chapter 1. We reminded ourselves of the truth that that wells up in our hearts, thankfulness. We then reminded ourselves from God's word, of his plans and purposes, we'll be reminded that we need to come before him in confession and that our sins are forgiven by Jesus alone and we'll depend upon him in prayer. That's the good news of Jesus, isn't it, in what we do in church. So let's go back to our question. What do we do in church? We do what the Bible says builds God's people in their fellowship centred on God's word, the good news of Jesus. Let me pray. Father, uh, today's really been a nuts and bolts uh, looking at what your word says God's gathered people are to do. Father, thank you for the flexibility here that speaks across cultures, across ethnic groups, across languages. And thank you for your wisdom in reminding us of what needs to be done. Father, help us to constantly delight in what you reveal in your word, which builds us up in fellowship so that we can worship, so that we can declare your glory, so that we can sing your praises as we go out. Father, through that, we pray that many in this town will be welcomed into your family and come to call you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.